Hello, everybody, and welcome to Barcelona. Sorry for the uh, dark, uh, rainy weather. I, I'm a local, and I swear it's not usually like that. Although that being said, autumn be autumn, and you cannot plan for those things. All right, so the presentation that we're going to give today is about container networking, a bit of an introductory one. Uh, so how many of you are familiar with uh, containers and run containers in production? Ah, that's a nice show of hands. Very well. Uh, so I hope that, that it will be very relevant to, to your uh, current knowledge and that we will expand it a bit maybe. Uh, but before we do that, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, myself, I'm Antonio Segura Puymedon. I work at Red Hat and also that second logo is from the Superfluidity Project, which has a lot to do with containers and microservices and, and so on. Uh, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm Neil Jerem. I'm with a company called Tegera, and, uh, which is the originator of the Calico, uh, Calico project. And um, yep, so that's me. I'll be talking yeah. a bit later and, on. And then we'll have Flavio Castelli, which I hope will arrive very soon. Otherwise, I'll have to pre present his part. And well, it's going to be a bit of improvisation, but it's good. It's good. All right, so let's, let's continue. First of all, I want to give like a word of disclaimer of which are the constraints uh, we took to uh, uh, take on such a broad topic like is container networking. There are many container engines, like I'm sure that if I ask, let's ask. Uh, so anybody here run LXC or LXD? You see, there's many container engines. Uh, there's also Rocket and so on, but today we'll just talk about uh, Docker, which is the, the most common one, um, and uh, also about container orchestration engines. We're also going to restrict ourselves to the two most common. There's a big missing one, uh, which is Mesos, which is also quite common, but due to time we had to restrict it to just uh, Swarm and Kubernetes. Uh, the thing is, each of these uh, orchestration engines comes with a set of um, assumptions or sometimes even uh, an interface that kind of um, couples the, the, the solution to some kind of networking. Uh, sometimes you can work around that, sometimes not, but we're going to explain a bit how, how that can look like. And finally, of course, what I'm saying today in two months, it's probably going to be obsolete because somebody else will come and innovate and, and so on, and that's, that's really a good thing. So the problem is uh, with, the, with the advent of containers, uh, a more important or uh, more uh, field-changing thing happened, which was the, the arrival of the architecture uh, based on microservices. Uh, how many of you know what microservices are? All right, less work for me, perfect. Uh, so due to the nature of microservices and how they are split into a lot of small containers uh, that, that each serve a part of the application and that each part can be served by multiple containers, uh, this implies a lot of uh, endpoints that you need to connect to your networking and a very changing one because the good thing about microservices or rather one of the good things is that uh, they allow you to, to scale up, scale down depending on the necessity so it gives you a lot of agility. So let's start first though with the foundation with, with all of you found when you first started with containers I suppose like most of uh, the developers here, you started by installing Docker and seeing what you can do with Docker. So let's start with the most basic one. When you would create a container and you would not have any kind of uh, networking thought out, you would just plug it into the networking of the host, right? So when the, what happens with this is that you just uh, have access to any of the interfaces that are on the host. So if I start it on my computer, I'll have the Ethernet and, I ha and I'll have the, the wireless card. And if you do something like show the links that you can see in the container, you can see them all. Of course, uh, having uh, the possibility to use them all doesn't mean that you can do changes on, on them, on the, on the devices or on the routing tables and so on, because what that would imply would be 
you could uh, <laughs> wreck havoc into the host networking, right? So typically, uh, Docker, when you start the container, it will uh, drop some of the capabilities. So you cannot do things like flash the addresses or change the, the routing tables and so on. You can do it, however, if you pass CapNet admin, uh, which is a Linux kernel capability. All right, so, uh, well, one thing I forgot to say about the previous slide is when would you use host networking? So uh, a very typical use case is when you want to do uh, infrastructure containers. So let's say that you are running Cola, so your Nova, Neutron, and so on are running uh, on containers and you want to network them. So the most uh, common way to do that is to just place them in the host networking and to have the host networking configured. Of course, you could do it otherwise. You could have Cola with uh, a VLAN-based networking with a driver, but it's, it's not so common. So this is the mode that most of you uh, used for the first time since it's the Docker's default in which Docker sets up a, a Linux bridge for, uh, for you that is not connected to anything. The only connection to the outside world is through forwarding, and I'm going to show a bit how it does that. Um, and to that Linux bridge, which in truth it's more like a switch because it has a lot of ports, uh, it just puts a VF device, and which is like a pipe, and what goes through VF0 appears on VF1. And the good thing is that VF1 and VF3, in this case, are already in uh, the kernel namespaces that uh, Docker sets up for the containers. So how does it look like when you look outside and inside? So from the outside, what you see is that uh, you have a bridge with an address. It's a, it's a private range, so it's completely isolated from outside. But since uh, Docker wants you to be able to serve things or the containers to go out, so it sets up forwarding. And for the return flows, it sets up uh, masquerading rules. And from inside the container, what you see is that you have an IP on that private range and that the default gateway is the one on the, on the host networking. Uh, the other important aspect is, as I, as I said before, that you should be able to open the networking that you give to, to the container. So otherwise, you cannot serve anything. So it would be quite useless. And to do that, uh, it uses IP tables. And uh, as you can see here, there is the, the Docker chain that sets up a, a DNAT rule so that the, the port uh, 8000 on the host will go to the port 80 on, on my Nginx container. And now I, I give the word to Neil. So, so now then you move on to um, kind of wanting to run containers on multiple hosts instead of, of just one. And, and when you do that, you, then two kind of new factors come into play. Um, so one of those is that you need to start being a little bit more careful with your IP addressing, because if all of the containers uh, were all just on a single host, and or, or, or if, you know, if you're only talking between containers on a single host, then uh, the IP addresses which those containers are going to use are never going to go anywhere outside that host. And so it doesn't really matter what, what, what IP addressing you, you choose there. But if you have, uh, say, a setup like this, where we've got three hosts, and let's say you want the yellow containers to be able to talk to each other, one of those on host A, one of them on host B, then then uh, so the, the IP, whatever IP address container, uh, uh, container one has, um, uh, that, that's going to kind of go outside host A. So, so a little bit more care is needed to, to avoid uh, uh, allocating overlapping IP addresses in case, cases where you don't want to ov allocate overlapping IP addresses. And secondly, you need to address the question of um, how the data gets from, from one of those uh, hosts to another. And of course, those things, uh, since we're at an OpenStack conference here, um, uh, th these are things that OpenStack, of course, has, has analogous answers for, for, for VMs uh, in Neutron. And if we look at the, um, let's look at the transport question first, the question of how that data gets from one of the hosts. So, so just to pin this down a little bit more, so imagine container, Container 01 is sending a packet to container 02. So clearly, what the first thing that happens is that data goes from 
container, the container on, on host A to its host, and then that host has to do something to get it from host A to host B, and then once it gets to host B, uh, the host B is able to deliver that packet to its, uh, its local container, the one in yellow numbered number two. And, and traditionally, um, Neutron has solved this problem using overlay networking. Uh, a thing called an overlay network. So, so an overlay network basically means that every packet that those containers want to send to each other get, gets wrapped by the, the source host inside some other um, IP packet. Then that IP packet is, is, is addressed to the destination host, so host B in this case. When it gets to host B, um, it gets unwrapped and delivered to uh, the, the destination container. So. Um, and this means that uh, the, the addressing that the containers have is, is completely independent of the, the, the host infrastructure ad addressing. It also means if you do that uh, kind of wrapping up such that you include the, uh, the layer two, the ethernet headers uh, that were sent by the original containers, then, then you can still simulate a layer two adjacency between the containers if you want to, even if uh, even if there were, let's say, intermediate routers in the fabric in between host A and host B. So that's not shown explicitly here, but there could be. Uh, if you're running on, let's say, GCE, for example, there were intermediate routers between every, every GCE node. Um, uh, so, so that's what overlay networking allows you to do. And uh, also, just, just on the addressing point once again, because of the point that the, uh, the addressing of the containers is independent of any IP addresses that are used in the host infrastructure network, that also means that you can, um, uh, use, you can use overlapping IPs. You, you basically can allow different users of your data, of your container cluster, to for example, what's called bring your own addressing. Um, so they, 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 they can quite happily, as long as you've got kind of a user of certain containers here, uh, over here, say the containers in pink, and a user of the container, another different, com completely separate user, say the users, uh, the containers in, in yellow, and as long as those never need to talk to each other, they can use the same IP addresses. Um, it just means that when you, when, you, when you kind of work out this way of wrapping the packets, when you encapsulate those packets, there needs to be something in the way that you encapsulate that it kind of uh, ha has, a, has a scope in it that is able to differentiate, uh, let's say, uh, if, if both containers are using 10.65.0.2, then, then say this is 10.65.0.2 for the yellow containers, and this is 10.65.0.2 for the pink containers. Um, so um, so that, that's that's overlay networking in a nutshell. I hope I'm not just telling you things that are already absolutely familiar to you all. But, um, but it comes at a cost of, um, of, of, of having to encapsulate and decapsulate those packets all the time. And there's a, kind of, there's, a, there's a performance cost to that. There's a slight complexity cost to that. There's a cost in terms of MTU, uh, uh, having to know what's going on with your MTU. Um, it's also a bit more difficult to troubleshoot. It means that in different parts of the fabric, if you're looking for a packet going from one place to another, or more typically looking for why you don't see a packet going from one place to another, then you need to know that in a different part of the network, you need to look for it in a slightly different form because it will be wrapped up in some way. Um, and so is there any alternative to that? And um, in fact, there is. And this is the thing that we're going to call rooted networking. So, so if you have a situation, so you kind of like look at this and say, well, what would I need to say if I didn't want to have an overlay network? So if you had containers which didn't actually need the layer two adjacency to each other, and also if you didn't need bring your own addressing. So in other words, if you were happy for all of your containers to be get their IPs from a managed flat IP space, where, which was managed in such a way that there were never any conflicts between what one group of containers wanted and what another group of containers wanted, and also managed so there were no conflicts between those IP addresses and the host infrastructure, then you don't need this overlay network. Then, essentially, you can basically just do IP routing to get um, uh, the packets from one container to another. And that packet will never be encapsulated or decapsulated anywhere. It will look the same anywhere you see it in a fabric. It will look the same. 
And this is what we call calling uh, a router network. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a load of uh, specific projects which are now implementing these approaches. And that was all kind of like preamble. So, so that I should just go through uh, some of the rooted and overlay projects which kind of provide all of these approaches. So, and actually, that's not the next slide. This one is. And, um, so this slide is showing some rooted approaches. The, 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 the thing on this slide which is saying Docker zero is, is, slightly, is, is not, not correct for all of these projects. So actually where it says Docker zero, what you should think of is that a packet is coming from one of the containers and is actually going into the routing table of the host. And then the, and then the host is, is routing that to wherever, wherever it needs to go. So I mentioned some implementations down there at the bottom, Calico, Flannel, and Romana. Um, so Flannel, I'm going to talk about Flannel and Romana first, because they are uh, similar in that what they do, uh, they, the way they manage the routing is that they say, well, a certain prefix, a slash 24, for example, belongs to a particular host. And then if, uh, so, so imagine container A is sending to container D, then uh, the routing table on, on, on host A could know that all of the 10.0.9 addresses uh, are for containers on host B. So basically, it can put an entry in its routing table which says 10.0.9 slash 24 via uh, that IP address there, which is the IP address of host B, so 172.16.0.5. And that's how... That's how uh, basically how Flannel and uh, the routing elements of Flannel and Romana work. Um, so Calico takes a slightly different approach. Um, so Calico actually doesn't say we want, we want to kind of reserve a slash 24 for every host because uh, when, when Calico started, we thought that was a little bit inflexible. So we go instead with allocating slash 32s. And I've, so I've, I've rearranged the IP addresses here. So you can see that you can have, say, 10.0.8 on so actually one on, one on host A, one on host B, and similar 10.0.0. So basically, with Calico, the addresses can be anywhere. And instead, what happens is that we use BGP to propagate those routes around to the other hosts that may need to forward data uh, to those addresses. Um, so to put a bit more, just a bit more detail on that. So what happens in Calico is that something, the orchestrator says, well, there's this container which should exist on host A. It's got an address of 10.0.8.2. And it will be, it'll be connected to the host. It has its own network namespace, um, but it's connected to the host by a vth pair. And so the first thing that happens is that on the host, we say we create a, a route in the local routing table, which says, well, to get to 10.0.8.2, please go through that vth interface. Okay? And then what happens is the BGP speaker, for which we typically use BIRD, um, notices that there's this new route in the kernel to 10.0.8.2. It then exports that to all of the other, it's all BGP peers. And um, the result of this is that the BGP on host B ends up with a route that says 10.0.8.2 slash 32 via 172.16.0.4. So that's um, uh, how Calico works. Um, but it, but the, the kind of the, the fundamental routing idea is the, the same. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that... Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? Do we need to... Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the the thing about this these rooted approaches is that they do need you need to know where you're going at every hop. So basically, we've got all of these IP addresses associated with containers, and everywhere every at every point where you have an IP routing operation in your data path, you need to uh, you need to know where the, the where the next hop is for a particular container address, um, and so. If you, sometimes that's tricky because, because sometimes, uh, as, as kind of indicated by this diagram, there are no intermediate routers between host A and host B, but sometimes there are. And if you've got intermediate routers in your fabric, then you either need to, if you, if you have the option of um, programming those intermediate routers or peering with them, then you can arrange that they all have those container routes as well. Or else you need to do something to skip over those 
and skipping over them is essentially introducing some other form of little tunnel or another little bit of overlay networking in this particular section of the network. And so what we, what we then, and this takes us on to flannel, because what we then move on to is a kind of, um, a, kind of a, a big picture in which sometimes you're, you're doing routing, but then sometimes you're kind of using a little bit of overlay or tunneling to, to, get, to get between two places. And, and flannel has some interesting, so flannel's a different project originated by the core, from CoreOS. Uh, and they, as I said, they do have this mode where they do routing and they assume that every host corresponds to a slash uh, 24 uh, prefix. They can also do the bridging as Anthony showed. So basically they can, they can bridge onto a device which performs a UDP encapsulation or, or a VXLAN encapsulation. And those are both forms of bridged networking that, um, that FAML can do. Um, or they can, but they also have a couple of nice options for running on AWS and GCE. So both AWS and GCE, um, and GCE always has routers uh, in between any two, any two nodes, but it does allow you to program some routes into the routing table which GCE uses. Uh, and so, so you can make use of that facility in order to traverse those intermediate GCE routers. That's, that's an option and Flannel provides that. Um, and AWS, of course, if you're running on the same subnet in a VPC on AWS, then you won't have intermediate routers. But if, you're, if you have hosts in different subnets, then you will. And again, AWS gives you the option of, of programming the, uh, the VPC routing table. Uh, and that's another thing that Flannel can allow you to do. So, so in other words, the upshot is you can have containers on multiple hosts on AWS, and Flannel will let you connect between them. So. Um, uh, the, the brief mention, this is a, a bit, a bit Tiger centric to my company. So, so, so my, my company originated Calico. We kind of, Calico kind of started off with this, this kind of very flat IP based connectivity model that I've, that I've showed you. Later on, we kind of realized that security was very important. So we added a lot, uh, a kind of a quite uh, interesting layer for describing the security that you need in a data center and then implement mapping that down onto IP tables. And that has really become, if anything, a more important part of what Calico does now than the basic connectivity. And we also were speaking to CoreOS and CoreOS said, well, we, you know, sometimes the, the flat layer three connectivity doesn't completely work on its own. You need to kind of add these methods for getting across intermediate routers, say in GCE. Um, and, and so we actually came up with this combined project called Canal, um, which, is the, which is fundamentally the idea of that is to say, we would like to provide a system which provides all of these different connectivity options for getting where, however you need to between your hosts, combined with the, the Calico security model for securing those connections. That's basically what Canal is. Um, but um, fine, let's skip that because I don't want to spend too long on that. Um, <laughs> so I should. So those those are the routing based approaches. So for completeness, let me just touch on all, all of the the, the the overlay approaches that are available for containers, and um, there are quite a few of these. So Docker itself provides um, an overlay method. So all all of these fundamentally, what is happening is that you're adding some encapsulation for getting getting between the hosts. And in cases where there are multiple scopes for the addressing, for knowing which, which scope you're kind of, or, or, which scope the encapsulation corresponds to. Um, and um, so Flannel, as I've already said, um, uh, has, uh, has UDP based and VXLAN based ways of doing that encapsulation uh, and providing those overlays. Weave is uh, another important project which, which does that. Um, and Docker itself uh, provides a native overlay. Um, I don't actually know full details of those myself, so if you have questions about that, I hope my colleagues will be able to answer at the end of the, end of the talk. But I do want to talk about career at this point. Um, and um, so career is the project which basically says that um, what if you're already really familiar with the Neutron API? And what in particular, if you, uh, you know, you, Neutron provides various forms of basic connectivity, so overlay and routed based, as, as we've been talking about itself. What if, what if you also really like some of the things in the Neutron API which are built on top of that, 
um, couldn't you just use that same abstraction, that same API, to connect all of your containers together? And, th and that's what, that's essentially what Career does. So the, the the first kind of phase of Career, and Anthony will correct me if I get any of this wrong. Um, the first phase of Career delivered that integration for Docker. So basically, making a lib plugin, uh, a lib network plugin. I mean which uh, connects to the Neutron API. And it means that um, anything, any kind of connectivity you can configure in Neutron then becomes the way that your containers are connected together. And the next phase of, uh, of um, a career is looking at extending that to Kubernetes and also to multi-level connectivity so that you can kind of connect both to uh, VMs and containers, and containers, containers running bare metal, and containers running VMs. So, but what that means is that um, any kind of form of either overlay networking or rooted networking that you can do in Neutron, by using Career to connect to your containers, you can actually do those same those same forms of connectivity uh, for containers via Career as well. Fine, and I think I've, <laughs> so I think I've probably uh, covered this slide already. So yes, I, I mentioned uh, VMs, containers, and containers in VMs. Um, and essentially, whatever form of networking uh, you choose, you can connect kind of hybrid forms of workloads together using this approach. Uh, so um, Fine, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to the end of my part here. This is a, just a, a, a quick uh, summary of or, uh, the, or comparison of routing and overlay networks um, uh, from a routing point of view. Um, perhaps they have better performance than overlay. Uh, I made this point about them being a little bit easier to troubleshoot and that wherever you look in your fabric, a routed approach, will, the packet will look the same. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, there are kind of typically points within uh, a, an infrastructure where you don't have complete control over every intermediate router. So either you you need to tunnel uh, that part, or you need to, um, or maybe if you do have control, but then you need to do something extra in order to kind of peer with with those intermediate routers so they know um, uh, know those routes. And um, that also means that if, if, in overlay networking, because essentially you're always tunneling from one host to another, it's not a very big step to go from there to, um, uh, uh, to traversing multiple clouds, uh, uh, to, to adding into cloud as well. Whereas if you're kind of like starting from a rooted network implementation where you're generally speaking or, or perhaps not at all tunneling anywhere, then it's a bit more of a thing to add on there. So fine, I think that's pretty much what that uh, slide says. So I will hand over the rest of the talk to Flavio. Yep. OK, thanks a lot. So <clears throat> you might think that now that we have connectivity, everything is done, everything is settled. In fact, there are still some challenges that are specific to these distributed environments that you still have to face. So first of all, there is the problem of service discovery. So to define the problem of service discovery, let's introduce some concept. So you have a producer who is a container which is running a service. And then you have a set of uh, consumers who are clients of this service. So now you need to find a way to put the consumers in contact with the producer. So the consumers have to find where, where the producers are located. So for example, here we have a web application running on host A, which is looking for a Redis database, which is running inside of another container, this time on a different host, on host B. So you can solve that problem and have the two of them in touch. But then what happens when, for example, the Redis database is suddenly moved from host B to another host? Like, what happens if there is a failure on host B and all the containers running on host B are automatically relocated to somewhere else? Now the web application is going to be broken. This is something that we don't want to happen. Also, <clears throat> what happens if, for example, you have multiple producers? So like here, we have multiple containers running on different hosts, each one of them providing a Redis database. Now, which one of these Redis uh, entry points we should use from the web point of view? So to solve this problem, 
there can be different approaches. You might be tempted to do things like, let's say, the old way, so like to use DNS. But now you have uh, introduced different problems. First of all, containers are really <clears throat> uh, fluid. They keep moving everywhere. So you cannot uh, assume that uh, the entry returned by your DNS server is still valid over the time. So you don't want your clients to cache these results. So you have to configure your DNS server to return replies with a really short time to leave, uh, maybe zero time to leave. And now you will think you're set, but that's not true because unfortunately you will realize that there are lots of broken clients out there that do not respect the time to leave. So they will keep caching this result and they won't react to, to sudden changes of infrastructure. So you will end up with something which is broken in an inconsistent way and it's really hard to, to debug. So this was the approach which was uh, used in the beginning with Docker when distributing containers. So initially they decided to update etc. host dynamically, then they introduced an integrated server. Now with 1.12 things are a bit different. So um, I'm going to talk about that later on. The, the, the approach used by a lot of people is to just rely on a key value store. So like something like etcd or console or zookeeper. So the producer, as soon as it starts, it will register itself into these uh, yellow pages. And it will say, hey, I'm here with this IP address and this port number. And then the consumers will either look up manually into the, the yellow pages, or uh, in most of the cases, it's up to the orchestration engine to just uh, automatically inject this kind of information into the application. So, <clears throat> for example, there could be environment variables or configuration files that are created with this kind of information. The other problem we saw before was how to, uh, to react to changes, how to handle multiple choices, and a new one, which is handling ingress traffic. So, to solve the problem of um, multiple changes and the problem of handling failures, um, orchestration engine like Kubernetes or Swarm, starting from version 1.12 of Docker, they have this concept of service. So as soon as you create a container which is a producer, so it's offering a service, the orchestration engine will also create a virtual IP address. So now, this virtual IP address will automatically redirect all the requests to any of the containers which are providing the service. So what you have to do is just to point or your consumers or your clients to this virtual IP address. And that will solve the problem of figuring out which Redis database we have to use, like in this picture. And it can also figure out what happens if one of the nodes goes down. Uh, the nice thing about that, uh, the last thing is that given that this virtual IP address is stable, you can just add DNS on top of it to, to just make legacy application work because now the IP address doesn't change, so there is no risk of caching uh, an IP address which is not persistent. So the ingress problem is about exposing an application which is running inside of, uh, inside of your container to traffic uh, from the outer. So what you can do, I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, you can just uh, <clears throat> ask Kubernetes or ask Docker Swarm to just publish uh, the service on, on each worker node of your cluster. So a port number on each node of cluster is going to be reserved. So all the traffic which is directed toward this port is automatically redirected to one of the containers which is actually running the service. So now you take all the traffic from the internet, you pipe it through a load balancer like a traditional one, you configure the load balancer to point to all the worker nodes inside of your cluster to this specific port on each node and then you're done. Uh, it's really important to notice that like in this chart, uh, it can happen, for example, that the load balancer redirects the traffic toward a node which doesn't have, uh, like host C, doesn't have any instance of a guestbook container. But that doesn't matter because from this public port on the node, everything is redirected to the virtual IP address of the guestbook, which automatically finds out where the guestbook is running. So to recap and leave some space for your question, <laughs> There are several approaches when it comes to networking in the container world. You can uh, have approaches that are either using an overlay or, uh, or a routing approach. 
that can be implemented uh, with CNI or with CNM specification. But most important of all, it's not just about uh, connectivity. It's more about that. It's about security. As we have seen before, it's about uh, uh, handling changes and handling ingress traffic and all of that. So with that, I think we can start a Q&A session. If anybody um, has a question, like I can, uh, sorry, I didn't realize this was so short. Uh, I can bring the microphone over. Any question? All right. So that's. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining the presentation. And if you have any question that you don't want to voice now, you can meet us later. <laughs> thank you.